I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at six in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Hey, Karen. folks, I ran a poll online, and about half of you think that Karen Reed is getting framed for the murder of her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe. Hey, let's dig into why I think the defense is creating a whole bunch of noise when all the evidence is pointing back at Reed. So let's chat about the Boston cop who was left to die in a Massachusetts snowbank. Well, welcome to Profiling Evil, and thanks so much for tuning in. You know, I spent some time on Court TV this week talking about this case. And frankly, I think the defense is doing the only thing that they can do at this point. They're creating a whole bunch of noise in hopes that the polls, the court officers, eventually a jury will come away with a completely different idea completely disregard the evidence and what I think is undoubtedly the truth. Now, I hope you'll take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button, folks. Ring the bell and, and make sure that you're getting all of Profiling Evil's videos as we release them. There are a bunch of social media creators out there who are crying foul play on this case. They're convinced that Karen Reed is being set up by a group of people, including cops, family members, investigators, and medical examiners who are framing her for the mur murder of her boyfriend. In fact, the noise is becoming so deafening that her defense team is even following this line of thought in a recent court hearing where they allege that the cover-up is real and that the cell phone data and smartphone uh, the smartwatch forensics are backing up what they have to say. They say somebody inside the home is responsible for O'Keefe's death and that they actually caused his death. Charged with running over her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, a Boston police officer, and leaving him to die in the snow, says she's being framed. Karen Reed spoke publicly about the case for the first time following a court hearing in Dedham. As Boston 25 investigates has reported, her lawyers claim they know who is responsible. Investigative reporter Ted Daniel was in court today. Ted joins us now live in the studio. The prosecution scoring a victory today, Ted. Yeah, Mark and Carrie, another action-packed hearing in this case. There were a number of people, as we've been reporting, inside the Canton home that John O'Keefe's body was found in front of. The defense subpoenaed two of them in an attempt to question them under oath. Today, the judge in this case rejected both subpoenas. Those two will not have to testify, at least not yet. We heard from Karen Reed shortly after that. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at six in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Karen Reed drew applause from family and friends. It's unusual for a murder defendant to speak like this before a trial date is even set, but there's nothing usual about this case. And we know who spearheaded this cover up. You all know. I am not having an evidentiary hearing in this case. Reed spoke after Judge Beverly Canoni oh. shut down an attempt by her attorneys to question two prosecution witnesses. One is Jennifer McCabe. The defense claims McCabe searched and deleted how long to die in cold before O'Keefe's body had been discovered. We know that she was Googling how long to die in cold at minimum, at minimum, three hours before John O'Keefe's body was ever found. McCabe's lawyer, Kevin Reddington, says McCabe is not a suspect in this case and shouldn't be treated like one. Hoping to embarrass, hoping to obviously uh, intimidate her as a witness. She has been cooperating with the government every step of the way. She has provided her testimony as any good citizen would do. The defense also wants to know what's on Brian Albert's cell phone. He owned the Canton home John O'Keefe was found outside of. Reed's lawyers say he received several calls from his sister-in-law, Jennifer McCabe. We're asking for evidence. Evidence that's material, evidence that's relevant, evidence that's salient third-party culpability defense. The prosecution calls it a fishing expedition, not based on fact. Karen Reed is now publicly pushing back. Me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. It just feels like no one else wants it. 
So the defense wanted a hearing about the cell phones. The judge said no to that. It's possible the judge could still grant Reed's lawyers access to the phones and the information on the phones based on their arguments that they've put in many court filings. A judge can make a decision on that at any time. For 20 and they say that somebody inside the home where O'Keefe died was actually involved in his death. Now, I thought you might be interested in a quick timeline of events in the case, especially for those of you who haven't been following it. And then I want to talk about the evidence that's being disputed. Lay some groundwork for this is probably the easiest thing to do. So to lay that groundwork, Karen Reed and John O'Keefe had been dating for a couple of years before his death. Karen was spending most nights at O'Keefe's residence, and it appears that their relationship was taking a downward turn and rapidly falling apart. Now, there have been text messages and eyewitness accounts of this failing relationship and also reported information. Reported information that O'Keefe told Reed that their relationship had run its course and that it wasn't healthy any longer. He'd actually asked her to leave, according to these reports, leave the house and vacate the relationship. But apparently, Reed refused. Well, on January 28th in 2022, O'Keefe and Reed started drinking at a local bar around 7 p.m. The bar was called C.F. McCarthy's. Now, this apparently is uncontested evidence, and it's supported by video in the bar. But for several hours, the two are drinking and partying. Now, Reed is specifically seen drinking vodka drinks and has at least seven of those that were captured digitally over the three, three and a half hours. During that time, again, there's evidence, physical CCTV evidence showing her drinking. Now, after three and a half hours, they left the bar and they walked a short distance to the waterfall, another bar where they stayed until just after midnight. Now, these are really important facts, folks, because um, I talk often about the fact that we need to have evidence that corroborates other evidence. And in this case, we actually have evidence supporting that Reed was drinking a lot. Again, seven drinks of vodka. I don't know how watered down they were, but this I do know. That there was bar staff and others who indicated she was drinking. There's CCTV imagery that says she was drinking. So now what we have is we have uh, eyewitness accounts and we have this forensic evidence from the CCTV and the physical evidence of it comes in the form of blood tests later that show that she had a blood alcohol level that was way over what the state limit of legally drunk is. Now, they uh, went to this other bar, and they were only there for a short time, and we roll into the morning of January 29th, 2022. It's about 10 minutes after midnight. Reed is seen on CCTV camera exiting the establishment with two other women. Moments later, O'Keefe also exits through the uh, bar, carrying a drink in his right hand. And again, this is a really important piece of evidence, folks. Uh, that drink becomes really important, and that glass becomes very important in evidence that was recovered later. Now, four minutes after they exit the bar, O'Keefe texts a friend and says, Where to? And he's given an address to a home where a party is apparently going to continue. Just a few minutes after that exchange, a black SUV that's later identified and believed to be belonging to Reed is seen on CCTV passing the Canton Town Library. Now again, that is solid evidence. And the evidence suggests, again, that it's Reed's Lexus SUV and that she's driving with O'Keefe and he's in the vehicle with her. She's driving He's a passenger. Again, keep in mind, she is legally drunk at this time, although that's, I think, the least of her problems in this case. They arrive at the home 20 minutes later on a place called Fairview Drive. And you can look up the address if it's that important to you. But the occupants of the home see that the couple has arrived and they actually text Reed saying, hey, pull into the driveway behind my car. Now, Reed apparently does so and pulls into the driveway but then a few minutes later, repositions her vehicle near a flagpole 
and a fire hydrant that's in front of the residence. Now, this is because apparently we learned through testimony that comes out later that she and O'Keefe were arguing and she was getting ready to leave. Now, according to witnesses in the home, the couple never come inside. And shortly after the vehicle arrives, it's, a, it's observed driving away. Now, about an hour after that vehicle scene driving away, one of the guests at the party decides to leave. And as she's leaving, she thinks that she sees something dark, a dark object in the snow out by the flagpole. She doesn't really give it much thought until after everything's revealed of what happened. And she remembers it very clearly. Now, the guests in the home are assuming that Reed and O'Keefe changed their mind and decided not to end the party. And the party goes on and on and on. Nearly four hours pass before Reed telephones the homeowner saying she's looking for O'Keefe, who's not responding to her phone calls or her messages. Now, Reed is advised that nobody has seen either one of them since they pulled into the driveway and then left. Other than that, it was back at the bar when they saw him. Well, Reed then calls another friend and tells her that O'Keefe didn't come home after she dropped him off at the party, and now she's worried. She then makes a weird statement to the friend, saying, and now get this, she says to the friend, speaking of O'Keefe, I wonder, in fact, I'm going to put this in quotations, quote, I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow, close quote. Well, shortly after 5 a.m., Reed convinces a friend to accompany her in looking for O'Keefe. And according to court documents, Reed, while they're together, makes another really bizarre statement while the women are driving to O'Keefe's house, hoping to check and find him there. While they're driving, Reed turns to her friend and says, quote, Could I have hit him? Did I hit him? Close quote. She then reportedly told the woman about a cracked tail light that she had on her SUV. And when they stopped, she actually pointed out the broken tail light. Well, I joined Vinnie Politan and a really impressive team of experts on Court TV to talk about this case. And while we were chatting, I was asked by Vinnie specifically about the broken tail light and my thoughts as an investigator and I had this response okay let's take a look at the Lexus SUV Mike King they observed fragments of broken glass on the rear bumper of the vehicle the rear right passenger side tail light was shattered and pieces were observed missing from the red and clear areas on the right side of the rear tailgate a deep scratch and minor dent were observed on the right side of the rear bumper, above a small red light, two scratches were observed and one area where paint was chipped off. Does that sound like that could happen from striking and killing John O'Keefe? Uh, ab- absolutely, and I think that's the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about is the fact that there is physical evidence that supports that there was a collision between that vehicle and some object, and his body happens to have a whole bunch of damage to it. I'm a kid from the Utah mountains, Vinny. I know what it's like in the snow, and I know how easy it would have been for him to slip or fall and that car to roll under him, and I'm really looking forward to what, to, to what forensics they might recover from underneath that vehicle. Doesn't look like dog bites to me, and it certainly fits the scenario, but they got to answer the elephant in the room. How did that broken glass get there? How did that uh, cocktail glass get embedded in the uh, bumper? How did that vehicle end up leaving the scene of an accident? Because I'm sure they're going to be able to compare that broken glass and that vehicle together. Well, the women, now joined by a third person, drove back toward the home where the party was occurring out on Fairview Road. A home where, again, she says, where Reed says she dropped O'Keefe off to attend the party. And she left because they were fighting. Well, as they near the home, Reed's in the back seat and shouts out that she spots O'Keefe lying in the snow near the flagpole. Now, the other women later would say that this was really odd because they couldn't see anything. And they were sitting in the same vehicle where Reed was. But Reed, when they pulled over, 
jumped out of the vehicle and ran to O'Keefe, laying on top of him and then beginning mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Now, her friends actually call 911, but they make a mental note that O'Keefe had about six inches of new snow on top of him. Obvious evidence, even though it was a blizzard, that he had been out there for a while. But inside, they're quietly wondering how she knew that O'Keefe was there near the flagpole. Well, a Canton police officer arrived first on the scene, and he went over and and discovered that O'Keefe was battered and cold to the touch. He was preparing to do some resuscitation efforts when a firefighter showed up. And uh, it was really interesting what the firefighter noted in her report. She said that Reed continued to say to her, quote, I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. Close quote. Well, by 7.50 in the morning, medical professionals were announcing that John O'Keefe had died. Police were continuing their investigation, and Reed was requested to do a blood test. Now, her alcohol level, again, nine hours after leaving the last bar, was still double what is required by law to be legally drunk in the state of Massachusetts and, quite frankly, most states in the United States. Well, by early afternoon, Massachusetts investigators seized Reed's vehicle, and they noted that broken tail light. They were able to actually visually match pieces of that same tail light from the crime scene where O'Keefe's body was discovered. Now, this is where we come back to that glass that O'Keefe was seen leaving the, the bar with. They also recover what's believed to be fragments of that same glass that O'Keefe was carrying, embedded into the bumper of Reed's car. Well, as medical personnel were lifting O'Keefe onto the stretcher at the scene, under his body they discovered his cell phone, which was later analyzed by Massachusetts State Police. And their forensic examination of the call logs, the voicemails, and the text messages between both O'Keefe and Reed including those dates, January 28 and 29, detailed how strained their relationship really was. It it also detailed that uh, O'Keefe wanted to end their relationship and uh, Reed's description of their relationship with them as the two together being toxic. Two days later, O'Keefe's autopsy was conducted by the chief medical examiner, who stated that O'Keefe's injuries probably incapacitated him almost immediately. He he wasn't able to do anything. He wasn't able to crawl to the home or anything else to get help. All he could do was lie in the, in the snow and freeze to death and die from his injuries. Well, the doctor further stated that there were no signs that O'Keefe had been involved in any kind of fight that night, but did say that his injuries were consistent with blunt force trauma, and tearing injuries. Something that I might add is consistent with injuries that I've seen in auto pedestrian accidents during my career. Well, it was during our discussion on Court TV last night that Vinnie Politan really threw a curveball regarding the tail light that included Reed's defense attorney arguing that the break actually occurred back at O'Keefe's home as, as they were backing out never happened at the crime scene, according to the defense. Vinny then showed video that was captured on home security cameras showing Reed backing into O'Keefe's car, and and we kind of openly wondered, could it really have happened there? Well, I was joined by Dr. Kenny Kinsey, a guy you might remember from the amazing testimony that he had during the Alec Murdoch trial, and Professor Joe Scott Morgan as we talked about this notion. And frankly, all three of us really pushed back on that idea. Let's watch. All right, let me throw a little curveball at everyone when it comes to that right rear tail light. Here's Karen Reed's defense attorney showing another piece of evidence that they uncovered. Take a look. The tail light was intact when she left uh, Brian Albert's house. She came home and this was Karen leaving 
to begin the frantic search for John O'Keefe. Now, I don't know that you can see it from the uh, the, the video that, that you have there, but there is no doubt that when that uh, uh, SUV comes uh, in, into contact with what is John O'Keefe's vehicle parked in the driveway, you can see the, uh, the, that rear tire move forward. It rotates. And you also see uh, the, the light uh, uh, shatter from the taillight being broken. All right. What do you think of that? So they've got at 5 a.m., so this is after the drop-off. She's already gone home. Now she's going back to try to find John O'Keefe. That's her story. She backs into John's car in the driveway, and we see John's car shake. Um, who wants this one? Who wants it? Look uniform the bat, today, Vinny. I, 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 don't see any, I don't see any kind nope. of physical disruption. <laughs> okay, so you don't you don't think that's what caused the damage here, Dr. Kinsey? You don't think so either? <laughs> no. no, sir, Vinny. That looked to me like bumper to bumper, and it was such yeah. low impact. I didn't, at least with my eyes, I did not see any broken tail light lens. Uh, and you agree, Mike? Yeah, I mean, I didn't see any glass fall into the ground there. And how are they going to respond to this? If forensically they tie that glass to sitting where O'Keefe's body is recovered, that's going to be a tall mountain to climb. Well, hey, folks, it's Mike from Profiling Evil, and I want to share my thoughts about our affiliate, Truthfinder. I use Truthfinder every single day to research the people and the cases that we're talking about here. But you can use it to reconnect with a loved one, find an old friend, or look up your former schoolmates. Now they make searching really easy, and all you gotta do is enter a name, an address, a phone number, or an email. Then you're provided with this really cool list that you can start to explore. Use Truthfinder to figure out who that new neighbor really is, or keep your family safe by checking out the parents in your kid's carpool. Now, many of you use the internet to search out new friends, but you can use Truthfinder to sniff out scammers and online predators, especially before you meet them in person. And folks, we get a small commission when you sign up. It's about enough to buy a small soda, but you gain the ability to satisfy your curiosity, protect your family, and find the truth out about people in your life. Please take advantage of the special Profiling Evil discount code. It's on the screen and it's also in the description down below. And remember, you can cancel this thing at any time. Now, let's get back to today's crime case. Well, with the mounting evidence that suggests that Reed was responsible for the death of Officer O'Keefe, Reed and her defense team went on the counteroffensive, and boy, did they come out swinging, claiming that she was being framed and stating that they know who really killed uh, Officer O'Keefe. Now, their theories are broad, but they include things like O'Keefe being dropped off at the party and him going inside the house where he got into a fist fight and was beat up by the people inside the house, including being attacked by the family's German shepherd. And the wounds that they say are from a dog are just absolutely crazy to me that they would try to suggest that those wounds, like we're looking at on the screen right here, were created by a dog bite. Dog bites usually end up, even with tearing, to have kind of a meteor-looking effect, not a straight, solid, cutting uh, view like we see here. That's consistent with being uh, run over and having uh, something cut across the body. But they say that after beating him up, the homeowners threw him out into the snow to die. Now, part of their reasoning behind this theory came from an, a, a forensic examination that a defense expert did on O'Keefe's smartwatch. Now, that defense expert says that O'Keefe was actually inside the home, moved as much as 80 feet around took about 80 steps, I think they said, and that he probably climbed several flights of stairs. Now keep in mind, this guy's mobile phone was found under his body after he was discovered deceased. Now Vinny shared some of the conversation he had on court TV with the defense, 
who argued that O'Keefe was actually inside the home and moving up and down the stairs. And he wondered what my colleagues and I thought about their theory that they were posing. And I'll tell you what, I had a lot to say on that. Let's watch this piece. The DA clearly stating the location data in John O'Keefe's phone, which again was found beneath his body uh, outside on the lawn, shows that he did not go in the house. Okay? Now, the defense says they don't have all of the information from prosecutors yet, but they do have information about his Apple health data on the phone for John O'Keefe. They're on my show. Here's what they say about the phone evidence in this case. The Apple uh, health data that Alan referenced uh, earlier shows that he did walk, I think, approximately 80 steps and uh, went up and down approximately three flights of stairs. Um, you don't do that by getting out of a vehicle and being struck by the vehicle. So what's, what gives here? Let's bring back in our experts. Dr. Kenneth Kinsey is still with us, as is, of course, uh, Joseph Scott Morgan and Mike King. So, um, uh, Dr. Kinsey, I'll start with you. You've got location data. Prosecutor says did not go in the house, but yet the defense says the Apple Health data is saying he took 80 steps. He's going up and down the stairs. What gives here? Well, Vinny, you know, we've seen that phone evidence before in a real close county to where I'm sitting right now, and it's always subjective. Uh, you can find, you know, one bit of data on one source, and it may not be in line or may not agree with the other source. So it's, I believe it's however it's presented, analyzed and presented, and, you know, let that jury weigh in on it. What, what are your thoughts, uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, when it comes to this phone data? We know how significant this is, and we know in the, the trial where Dr. Kinsey was the star witness, how specific the evidence was about where Alec Murdoch was. I could, I could like picture him walking around uh, with such a great uh, testimony in that case. What do you think here when the Apple Health is talking about 80 steps up and down three flights of stairs? The defense is gonna argue that he was going down in the basement. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening down there during this after party. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Okay, well, I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Contrary to what we might think in the world in which we indwell nowadays, uh, phones are, in fact, inanimate objects. They don't move on their own. So how are you going to put that phone into his hand necessarily? And I think that that can be argued, and any sharp attorney could make that argument as well. You know, how, how can it be stated that he was physically holding that phone as it moved about? And that's, you know, that, that's the big point of contention here. Yes, the phone is moving about, but how do you place it actually into this gentleman's hand to facilitate that movement? And I think that that's a question that could be asked before the jury, and it's certainly something that would be quite thought-provoking. Uh, Mike King, your thoughts about the conflict of this phone evidence? I think it's so significant in this case because I was... I was so convinced by what happened down in low country. Well, Kenny and Joe are both absolutely correct in two areas. Uh, one, and, and the one thing that I want to say is that that phone physically has to move uh, around and you got to be able to talk about it. But there is a thing called cellular drift. And when you're talking broadband, Vinny, things get really tricky here. A horizontal location like Dr. Kinsey saw in the Murdoch case is one thing, being able to say he walked from this point to this particular point. When you start bringing into it a vertical axis and you start looking at that Z coordinate, things get a lot dicier. And it's going to take for even a pretty good signal no, it's going to take one satellite that's exactly overhead and about three that are surrounding that to bring that triangulated and then quadrated information together to say, yeah, I think it's in about this area. But all the experts agree that vertical change could be anywhere from 35 to 70 feet. That's that's close to seven stories. So you got to really take into account that, you know, think about an airplane pilot when they go in and they set the barometer on their airplane, that's gonna tell them whether they're gonna fly into a mountain or not. 
because weather can change it. The interior of a building can change elevation. All of that can be um, something that could impact this. And so this isn't an easy answer and it is gonna take the experts to get in and really dice this out and help a jury understand. And frankly, 70 feet's an awfully big area to try to compensate for. Now folks, I just wanna reiterate how unreliable elevation data is by showing this little video clip of me recording my own phone location at my home right now. Now, as you're watching this, I want to make sure you understand, I'm not moving at all. My phone is sitting in one location on my desk, not being touched. Now, when you think about this from a technology perspective, depending on the quality of signal the phone is receiving, whether it's getting its location information from triangulating off of cell towers or from an array of satellites or through Wi-Fi and other means, the location accuracy can vary a lot. Now I hope that as you see this cellular drift that's going on, that you can understand that this science of location is not perfected. It's better than it's ever been, but it's still pretty dang unreliable. So let me reiterate what the experts say about elevation location. The fact that it could be off as much as 70 feet or more. I mean, that's equivalent to seven floors in a building and can certainly explain, depending on the quality of signal out there, how that phone appeared to be moving around, suggesting he might have been moving when in reality he laid in the snow where he was hit by the vehicle. Now, the biggest potential bombshell came from the defense by alleging that one of the conspirators in the home had Googled the phrase, how long to die in the cold? Now, the defense says it happens at 2.27 a.m., and if they're accurate, the question would be, why on earth are they Googling that kind of a thing if they had nothing to do with Reed, uh, or with uh, O'Keefe's death? And keep, and keep in mind, folks, if all of this is accurate, Reed was back in her home at the time all this was happening. But I had a few thoughts that I shared on court TV, and, and I want to just point out, in reality, if the defense is right... This could be the biggest piece of evidence they have going for them. Or it may be that I'm right in my recollection of the evidence. Let's watch and see what you think. It's a Google search. How long to die in cold? How long to die in cold? Is this the smoking gun? Is this the smoking Google? Alan Jackson, the attorney for Karen Reed, explains the significance of this search. Why is Jennifer McCabe, one of the parties that was inside the house that night, the sister-in-law of Brian Albert, why was she Google searching? How long does it take for a human body to die in the cold? The Apple Cocoa Core data indicates, or the core time indicates exactly what time that Google search uh, occurred. That time was at 2.27 and 40 seconds uh, in the morning on, on January 29th. That's three and a half hours before John O'Keefe's body was found. All right, all right. Let's, um, uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Mike King on this one. Google search, 2.27, I mean, shouldn't we, all be able to agree what time a Google search is done? It seems like there's a, a disagreement here. Otherwise, I mean, Jennifer McCabe is Googling how long to die in cold, perhaps at 227. Yeah, and, we, and we've heard some some evidence that suggests that maybe she was instructed to look that up. Um, but bottom line is, how did that happen? And then I guess the bigger question to me, Vinny, is why was it deleted? And, uh, and and that certainly casts a lot of question. And and this one is gonna boil down to the totality of the evidence. And I'll tell you, when things like this happen, it sure makes it a, a lot brighter for the defense. It, it does. Uh, well, Vinny and I got into quite an exchange on this particular topic, and I thought I should share the rest of that discussion with you. So let's watch that. You know, Mike, as I, I look at that statement, and I always look at evidence this way, you know, DNA and, and other evidence, like if Karen Reed had Googled that, that would be the headline for prosecutors, right? 
If she Googled that, that would be their headline. So I'm, I'm trying to understand um, if, it, if it comes out in front of this jury that it was at 227, this is almost a game over kind of thing. Well, unless they're able to bring in the other evidence that explains it, and, and some of that we're starting to get see a hand tipped here and there that maybe uh, she was encouraged to look that up. How, who was she encouraged but by? But who's encouraging her to timing? look that up? At 227, at 227, she's with her brother-in-law and everybody else at that party while John O'Keefe is laying outside dying. Yeah, and, and I might be wrong, Vinny, but it seems to me like I heard somewhere along the line that uh, she was contacted by Reed through a text or something to talk about this. And I could be completely off base That's here. later that's on in the morning. I me. think it's later on in the morning is when that happens. And that's when the alleged confession comes through and everything else where she says, "I did I, did I hit him? I think I may have hit him. Did I, could I have hit him? Um, so if, if the, that would make sense if the timestamp makes sense, but the contact isn't until like five o'clock in the morning between Karen and Jennifer McCabe. Um, so I don't know, but what a great job tonight. Dr. Kenneth Kinsey, great to catch up with you. Joseph Scott Morgan, Mike King. Listen, I feel like Mr. T in the A-team here. This is awesome. <laughs> See you guys. Well, the state continues to contend that Karen Reed ran over her boyfriend and left him to die in a blizzard. True, thank you. 25 Investigates has been going through new filings in the case against Karen Reed. She is charged with secondary murder in the death of her boyfriend, Boston Police Officer John O'Keefe. The filings were submitted by the Norfolk DA's office, and in them, prosecutors are pushing back hard on allegations of a cover-up. Investigative reporter Ted Daniel walks us through the latest filing in this high-profile case. This is the first time the prosecution has responded to multiple claims made by Karen Reed's defense team that she's been framed and this was a cover up. John O'Keefe was found dead outside of a Canton home of a Boston police officer in January of 2022. Police have accused Reed of hitting him with her SUV and leaving him to die in a blizzard. As 25 investigates reported earlier this month, Reed's lawyers say autopsy photos show O'Keefe was not hit by a car but was beaten severely and had marks on his arms that appear to be dog bites. Well, according to prosecutors, this is how they're responding. They say the medical examiner who performed an autopsy on O'Keefe detailed that she observed no signs of an altercation or fight from her examination and described his right arm injuries as scratches caused by a blunt object, not by a dog. The defense says one of the witnesses made an incriminating Google search hours before she claimed O'Keefe's body was discovered. Here's how the prosecution responds to that. The Google search, how long to die in cold, did not occur at 2.27 a.m. The prosecution argues that the defense incorrectly interpreted the witness's cell phone data. People inside Brian Albert's home told police O'Keefe never came in. Reed's defense team says data pulled from O'Keefe's phone shows not only did he go inside, but he traveled three flights of stairs. The prosecution has an answer for that, too. They say their data shows O'Keefe hadn't even arrived at the house when that movement was recorded on his phone. Mr. O'Keefe's phone would have been ascending, descending within the Fairview residence prior to his arrival. That's according to the prosecution. All of this just appears to add more intrigue to this case. And if it does go to trial, it's likely going to come down to a battle of the experts. The prosecution has their version of the data. Her defense is going to continue to argue that prosecutors failed to investigate other people in the home who could have been involved in O'Keefe's death, including people who attended the party at the home the night O'Keefe's body was found. Now, keep in mind, that is one heck of a big group of people to keep involved in a conspiracy telling the exact same story. It just doesn't make sense to me, and I don't buy it. But here are a couple of really important things that we need to consider. They come from the grand jury proceedings and from court documents. Now, the state is contending that the defense is making assumptions without any merit, and they have the evidence to support the claims that they're making. This case, folks, is going to boil down to a battle of forensic experts, a battle that surrounds phone calls, text messages, 
online searches and the device, the mobile device location accuracy. Now, if the defense is right, and one of the homeowners actually was searching on Google for how long to die in the cold at 2.27 in the morning, it might be case over. Now, that homeowner that the defense is pointing their finger at says, no, no, Reed asked me to query that very information, but that didn't happen until after O'Keefe's body was discovered in the snow. Now, the prosecution says the homeowner did, in fact, query the search, and they say they're going to produce evidence that supports that it happened after his body was found, not at 2 o'clock in the morning. They say the defense expert's absolutely wrong in the assessment that he made on that time of day. Now, the defense is going to argue that there are conspirators in this case who want Reed framed, that they deleted items from phones, and that it was a conspiracy among all of them. The prosecution says that it can absolutely prove that all of that is false. So So my question is, what are your thoughts on this one, folks? Do you think Karen Reed is being framed? I hope that you'll put your comments down below. And I want to thank you for supporting Profiling Evil and for being part of our family here. You can find Profiling Evil on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and of course here on YouTube. We really appreciate all your support. We appreciate your donations. There are links to take care of all of that. And I hope that you'll consider liking and subscribing to our channel. And please tell your friends about us. And if you like podcasts, please check out Profiling Evil Podcasts on your favorite podcast platform. Hey, thanks again and and have a great weekend, especially those of you who are living in the United States. Enjoy the Labor Day weekend. And to the rest of you around the world, I hope you have a safe weekend. And we'll see you soon at the next crime scene.